Let's pray together. What a great anthem for our hearts to sing this morning, O Lord. To acknowledge you as Father because you sent your own Son in the place of rebels to make us sons by adopting love. Our only trust, our only boast, our only hope is in those wounds that plead for us. We thank you for rescue in the gospel. We thank you for forgiveness of sin. And we thank you for all of that bringing us to your heart of love by adoption. Lord, help us this morning to hear your words. I pray there would be no deaf ears or hardened hearts here this morning. Would you soften, break up hard ground, give your word an entrance and a home by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. My favorite uncle in Florida was briefly stationed at a remote military base in Alaska, and he set his alarm clock early to wake himself up. He went away on a fishing trip and did not turn off the alarm, so it woke up the men in his barracks in his absence. They didn't take too kindly to this. They took his alarm clock out into the Alaskan wilderness and shot it to smithereens. (laughs) They returned the pieces of the alarm clock along with the spent shell casings to his dresser. When he returned and discovered that his beloved alarm clock had been taken out and shot, he was dismayed. An alarm is designed to wake you from slumber. Gospel preaching is like that. An alarm to wake the spiritually dead. The sound of life in gospel preaching can be grating to the ears of those who don't want to hear. An annoyance. Too early, too loud, wrong song. They don't want to be alarmed by truth speak. They would rather snooze through the warning about sin and eternal consequences. One way or another, they would just rather the alarm stopped making noise. Never mind that we must wake from our spiritual stupor as we sleep in a burning house. Acts 1.8, Jesus tells His disciples they would be His witnesses. Beginning in Jerusalem, to Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. And generation after generation of Jesus' followers have been His witnesses. For nearly 2,000 years, sounding the alarm about sin and righteousness and coming judgment. Inviting and pleading with the world to find shelter from the coming storm. To find rescue and hope in Jesus Christ. To have forgiveness of sins and the free gift of eternal life. Many of our fellow alarm clock witnesses have been taken out and shot or stoned to death or fed to the beasts, slain by gladiators, burned at the stake, starved, strangled. Some of us have lived long, comfortable lives in easy times and easy places. Perhaps our difficulty in such times is remembering why it is we're here. We get distracted. In a remarkable turn of God's ordering of history and His redemptive plan, the story winds up back where it started. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. We find at the end that people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people are back in Jerusalem. In Revelation 11, we discover the most remarkable career of two witnesses sounding the alarm of coming judgment. They are, in fact, Jesus' last two witnesses on this earth. They are steel-spined and they are maligned. They are courageous and hated. 
And like my uncle's alarm clock, these two witnesses are cut down for doing their duty. Let's read the story, the future history of their career. And we'll take in some lessons for our own hearts. Look down at Revelation 11. Then a measuring rod like a staff was given to me, saying, Get up and measure the sanctuary of God and the altar and those who worship in it. And leave out the court which is outside the sanctuary and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will trample the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wishes to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wishes to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the authority to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. They also have authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they wish. And when they have finished their witness, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them. They stood on their feet and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. By way of outline this morning, we'll look at seven features of the remarkable career of Jesus' last two witnesses on earth. Seven features of their career. The first is the setting. We find this in the first two verses and we discover a place and a time period. Look at verse 1. Then a measuring line, a measuring rod, like a staff, was given to me, says John, saying... Get up and measure the sanctuary of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the sanctuary. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will trample the holy city underfoot for 42 months. There is here a temple, a sanctuary with inner court and outer court. There is an altar, a reference to the bronze altar for animal sacrifice. This scene in Revelation 11 is a very Jewish scene. In fact, Gentiles are marked out for exclusion from the sanctuary. We are talking here in this scene about the city of Jerusalem in the land of Israel. This is literal geography, a literal place. Verse 8 clarifies this. This great city is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. And it's helpful to see that it is spiritually called so. Its literal location is designated by where also their Lord was crucified. And what the book of Revelation gives us in this section from really chapter 6 all the way to the end is future historical narrative. These events were future to the time of John the Apostle who wrote in AD 95 and they are future to us still. This is literal history in years yet to come. And this is significant because if you go to Israel today, you will find no temple. The altar has been removed. The worshipers were scattered decisively in A.D. 70. That event took place 25 years before John wrote this book. Now in 2024, it's been 1,954 years since there has been no temple in the city of Jerusalem. For almost all of that time, there's not even been a nation state called Israel. 
And there is right now no temple in the city. There has not been one for a long time. The place where the temple belongs has been raised flat by Titus Vespasian and has been more recently inhabited by the Muslims. Up there, of course, is the Dome of the Rock. The temple site in Jerusalem is the supposed site of Muhammad's ascent to heaven. And so it becomes one of the three great holy sites in Islam. In the modern nation state of Israel, Israel seceded to the Muslims control of the Temple Mount. And with that conciliation ever since, the Muslims have controlled it. There is no animal sacrifice there. And this creates a problem for practicing Jews in our day. I say practicing because they cannot truly practice. Leviticus 17.11 says this, The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Leviticus 17.11 gives God's Old Testament gracious provision for dealing with sin. It was, of course, a, a pointer to Christ when he would come, but for Jews today who reject Christ, there is no sacrifice operating to take care of sin. And the modern Jewish sentiment for those who practice Judaism, but who cannot practice Judaism, the thought is, try your best. God must know that we can't sacrifice. In the modern era, there are regular attempts to get back the temple complex, to reinstate animal sacrifice. But such is not the case now. How will Revelation 11 and these two witnesses giving testimony on the site of the temple in Jerusalem happen if there is no temple? What temple is described here? There are a number of temples in the scriptures. Uh, we might say there are seven. And I say might say because several of them are architectural. Architectural. The first temple, of course, is in 1 Kings 8 in the building that Solomon built. It was the wonder of the ancient world. That's temple number one. Temple number two, Zerubbabel and Jeshua in the return from Babylonian exile rebuilt the temple. Uh, it was a shadow, it was a, a ramshackle copy of Solomon's. It was rebuilt, this would be temple three, by Herod before the time of Christ. And that third temple is the one that stood in Christ's day. Jesus himself called it my father's house, even though it was built by uh, a, a hypocrite, uh, non-practicing half-Jew named Herod. We might label the fourth temple, y'all. The Yaw Temple. And the U Singular Temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, both describe believers as the temple of the Holy Spirit, the dwelling place of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is, you singular as an individual are a temple of God, and you collectively, the church, are the temple of God. And instead of being in Jerusalem, these temples scatter to the ends of the earth. In Solomon's temple, with Jerusalem at the, at the center, and the, the temple was the building where the world was to come and meet the God of Israel. Now the God of Israel inhabits the hearts of his people, and they go to the ends of the earth. We might call that temple four. Temple five is the temple we see in Revelation 11. It is a rebuilt temple. It does not exist right now, but it will exist Whenever these events take place, it is still yet future. There will be a reinstatement of sacrifice in this temple. There will be a priesthood and there will be the most egregious blasphemies. Temple 5 is the millennial kingdom outlined in Ezekiel 40 to 48. That is when Jesus reigns on the earth and there is a temple in the millennial kingdom in Jerusalem. I Sorry, that was temple 5. You were looking at each other. Temple 6 is the millennial temple. And then temple 7 would be the eternal state. But if you read Revelation 21, you discover there is no temple in the eternal state. What is the dwelling place of God with his people? No altar, 
No sacrifices, no sanctuary, just God with his people with immediate access. So the place here is a temple in Jerusalem that does not currently exist. What is the time frame? The time frame here is in this section of the book of Revelation, the Lord's day, as John calls it. The day of the Lord. It is the end of the days of man. The day of the Lord begins with the tribulation, that seven-year period of trouble, the second half called the great tribulation or the great and terrible day of the Lord, and it culminates in the reign of Messiah and His reign on earth. What we have here in Revelation 11 is part of the break in chronology. John has been telling us chronological history of the future beginning in chapter 6 up through chapter 9, and then we had the break in chapter 10, and here we are out of the chronology in chapter 11. John is zooming out and giving us a career of two individual remarkable witnesses. This time frame is not the church age. There's a clear distinction in this passage between Jew and Gentile. That's not true in the church age. Uh, The Jew-Gentile distinctions have been flattened out and we're all equal in Christ in God's plan in the church. There is, of course, the presence of the temple that Daniel and Jesus predicted would be present at the time of Antichrist. The distinction between this age in Revelation 11 and the church age will also be clear in the message and the miracles of the two witnesses It will be particularly seen in the way they deal with their enemies. Notice in verse 1 of Revelation 11, a measuring rod like a staff was given to John. John here is participating in this vision of the future. And this measuring stick is not to mark out distances, not to mark out dimensions. Uh, There are places where measuring sticks are given for that purpose, but there are other places in Scripture where what is marked out by a measuring rod is marked out for purpose. That which is protected, that which is excluded, and that's the case here. The reed here is a reed as a rod. In the New heavens and new earth, the new Jerusalem is marked out by a reed. This is a a long riverbank cane uh, that had a a solid, sturdy, circular husk to it. It was used for measurement. It could be used as a walking stick. The one that measures the new Jerusalem in the eternal state is made of gold. This one's not made of gold. It is a rod. And that is a word that is used often in times of judgment for reproof. For chastisement? What is the marking out of this sanctuary for? It it marks a time of judgment for the world. It also marks out a time of promise for Israel. But Israel's history here will be the promise of chastisement leading to repentance. It will be a purging, a refining, what the Old Testament called a troubling of Israel. In fact, Israel will not come to national repentance until they see Christ at His return, until the full count of the Gentile believers come in. In the meantime, there are 144,000 Jewish males who believe, and then there are these two witnesses. The full coming in of Jewish belief will not be till the end. So this time period marks the final days of Israel's apostasy and unbelief. In fact, Daniel, the prophet in the Old Testament, tells us the reason that Israel is able to rebuild this temple is because they enter into an agreement with the Antichrist, the beast, the man of lawlessness. And the fact that Israel has rejected their own Messiah and they are willing to embrace the satanically empowered imposter as their hope for national renewal demonstrates their spiritual state. As a nation, they are not yet in faith in this scene. Of course, that imposter who makes an agreement with Israel will break his covenant halfway through the tribulation, and he will in the end lead the world's armies in a final attempt at the final solution at the extermination of Israel at the Battle of Armageddon. Listen to God's promise in Zechariah 13. It will come about in all the land, declares Yahweh, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish but the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third 
through the fire. Refine them as silver. Test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say Yahweh is my God. There is hope in that promise and severity in that promise. Two-thirds of the nation will be cut off in unbelief during that time. But the third that remains will believe the gospel en masse. These days will bring in Israel's final regrafting back into the natural root, to use Paul's language in Romans 11. To use Zechariah's words in Zechariah 12, they will look on Jesus whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as for an only son. And they will do so by the Holy Spirit's power in grace and supplication, in repentance and faith in the gospel. There are a couple more clues about the timing of this event. In verse 3, we get the marker of 1,260 days, which matches the 42 months in verse 2. That is three and a half years. And that equation, 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, or as Daniel and John both refer to it as a time, two times, and a half a time, that is one year plus two years plus a half a year, still equals three and a half years. They are all identical time frames. And these two witnesses will exercise their witness ministry for three and a half years. It may overlap the three and a half years of the second half of the tribulation. Um, it may be identical with the three and a half years. There are not details enough in the text to tell us whether or not it is exactly identical um, or whether the time frame is merely coincidental. We know something about, else about the time in verse 7. Look down there. When they have finished their witness, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. So we know that their ministry takes place during the time of the Antichrist, the beast. We'll find out more about him as the book of Revelation unfolds. A third clue is in verse 14. John writes, the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. The first woe was the fifth trumpet judgment, which concluded in chapter 9. The second woe is the sixth trumpet judgment. This ministry coincides with the ending of the sixth trumpet judgment of God. The, the sixth of the series of trumpet judgments of God's wrath against the earth. That concludes. That's called the second woe. The third woe is the seventh trumpet, which unfolds seven more judgments called bowl judgments. But those seven bowl judgments happen in rapid succession. Days, maybe weeks, one after the other culminating in the battle of Armageddon and the return of Christ to the earth. So wherever these two witnesses take up their ministry, their timing is towards the end of the tribulation. And it may be identical to that last three and a half year period when the Antichrist has entered the temple and declared himself to be God, demanding worldwide worship. The second feature of their career is their message. Look at verse 3. Jesus speaks here and says, I will give my two witnesses and they will prophesy 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. Some English translations add the words, I will give authority to my two witnesses. But literally the original text just simply says, I will give my two witnesses. These two witnesses are given by Jesus to the world for his purpose. They are witnesses to him. And they are witnesses for him. A witness is one who gives testimony to the truth. And Jesus says they will prophesy. That is, they will speak God's direct revelation. What will they do? They will rebuke sin, confront idolatry, expose deception. Notice here they are clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth was a clothing that represented a call to repentance. It was the, the garb of mourning. And the prophets in the Old Testament wore sackcloth as a mark of ju God's judgment that was coming. What is their message? The end is near. New Testament prophets and church age witnesses don't wear sackcloth in their gospel preaching. 
We do preach repentance, we do preach coming judgment, but the sackcloth adorning these two witnesses stresses the urgency of the situation for the whole world. Their message is, time's up. And we discover, verse 10, that their message torments the earth dwellers. Their truth speaking is seen as judgmental, as hate speech, as torment. Why are there two of them? I'm not sure we could say for certain, but there were pairings throughout the Scripture that are interesting. In the Old Testament and New Testament, two witnesses were needed to bind any testimony. And then you have camaraderie in their witness. The whole world will be against them. It might be helpful for them to have each other. You remember Caleb and Joshua, Moses and Aaron, Zerubbabel and Jeshua. The 12 and the 70 were sent out in early evangelistic enterprise two by two. There may be something to that. These pairings are common enough. But their message is one of final alarm. Final warning that the days of man have come to an end and that the Lord of the earth is coming back to reclaim what is rightfully his. So you best be on his side. The third feature is their identity. Look at verse 4. These are the two olive trees. You've been wondering who they are. Here's the answer. They're the two olive trees. They're the two lampstands. They stand before the Lord of the earth. Those are the descriptions we are given. They're called the two olive trees and the two lampstands. The article there indicates that John and his readers would have some reference for understanding them. Uh, what, what olive trees have been mentioned in the book of Revelation? We, we don't have anything like that yet. What are these? Who are these ones standing before the Lord of the earth? You need to turn to Zechariah chapter 4. This is a clear reference to this chapter. Zechariah is, uh, is preaching in the exile and post-exile. That is the Babylonian, ex- Babylonian exile. And, and the Jews are returning to the land. Look at Zechariah chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. The angel was speaking with me, returned and roused me as a man who is roused from sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold, a lampstand, all of gold with its bowl on the top and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Also, two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. A lampstand technically is a stand for a lamp. That's what it's for. Its purpose is to hold up that which gives forth light. And often olive oil was used as the fuel for lamps. And, and here are these two olive trees on either side of this lamp stand in Zechariah's vision of the very presence of God were pictures in Zechariah's day of the Holy Spirit of God's very presence. God was the light. And the lampstands were there to hold up the light, to put forth the, the truth and, and demonstrate the presence of God. Look at Zechariah 4.11. What are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left? I answered the second time and I said, What are the two olive branches beside the two golden pipes, which empty the golden oil from themselves? So what does Zechariah see? He sees these two olive trees next to the lampstand holding up the seven lamps. And the olive trees supply the oil for the lamps. But what are they? The angel spoke to Zechariah saying, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones. Literally, these are the two sons of oil who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. Same language that is used in the book of Revelation. In Zechariah, these two demonstrate the faithfulness of God. It's the presence of God on display with this lampstand and the light. And then the faithfulness of his servants would be critical. You need the presence of God and the faithfulness of his servants in Zechariah's day for the return to the land and for the rebuilding of God's temple after the exile. This was about heart preparation of the people for the return. If the return from exile was going to be of any value, it had to be about more than a construction project. 
Uh, The glory of the Lord had left the temple. Uh, The people of the Lord had been banished from their land. And if they were to return with hearts for Yahweh, God's spirit must be at work. Grace must be at work. And God's servants must be faithful. That's what these things picture. In fact, right in the center of this chapter, we get these words, Zechariah 4, 6. This is the word of Yahweh to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says Yahweh of armies. What would bring about a successful return to the land? God's people from the heart worshiping him. That could only come about by the Spirit. And God's people who worship Him from the heart being faithful in the tasks God gives them. And so Zerubbabel and Jeshua are seen as being the faithful leaders bringing the people back to the land. In Revelation 11, we have these two witnesses and they are called the two lampstands and the two olive trees. And what's fascinating is this change from one lampstand to two. Maybe that's an indication that we're not talking about the the temple in heaven and and one platform from which the light of God shines, but here in these witnesses in the future Jerusalem, two. Multiple witnesses on the earth. These two witnesses in Revelation function both as the platform for the light of God's truth and they are the sons of oil standing by the Lord of the earth. That is, they're the ones supplying fuel for the lamps. In Zechariah's prophecy, those were two separate entities, one lampstand, two olive trees. In the book of Revelation here, now they are both lampstand and olive tree. They serve again, just like Zerubbabel and Jeshua in Zechariah's day. They serve to prepare the way for Israel's return to the land and for God's very presence to return to the temple in Jerusalem. They are the end times Zerubbabel and Jeshua. Getting the land and the people ready for Messiah. But who are they, you ask? I'll give you two categories of answers that uh, theologians have given over the years. Moses and Elijah, or Enoch and Elijah. Maybe you've heard these before. Moses and Elijah are often picked because the miracles these two witnesses do resemble them. Moses turned water to blood. These witnesses turned water to blood. Elijah uh, brought fire, and these guys bring fire. Moses and Elijah represent the Old Testament. It was Moses and Elijah that show up on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. It's like the Old Testament prophets and the Old Testament law show up and say, listen to Jesus, the Word of God incarnate. Uh, Perhaps those two, they've been paired before, maybe they're paired again. And then there was a Jewish tradition that that stated that Moses didn't die, uh, but he was allowed to look into the promised land, then he went up into the, the, the wilderness mountains at Sinai and then just sort of ascended without dying. Um, That's not a biblical tradition. Deuteronomy 34, 5 says Moses died and God buried him. Why is it attractive to think of somebody not dying? Well, because whoever these two guys are, they end up dying in this scene. So it can be attractive to try to think of guys, two guys from biblical history who never died. So the second category of thought declares these to be Enoch and Elijah. And neither one of those men died. And Enoch is interesting. Listen to Genesis 5, 21 to 24. Here's the record we have of him. Enoch lived 65 years, became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God. By the way, that stands out in the narrative of death in the genealogy in Genesis 5. Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. And he had other sons and daughters. And so all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And that difference is striking because everybody else in that list died. He was born, he had kids, and he died. He was born, he had kids, and he died. Enoch walked with God, and then he wasn't because God took him. It's something of a pre-rapture rapture. And Enoch was unique in his era. He was 
countercultural. He, he walked with God in the centuries before the flood. He was a witness to the grace of God. Listen to the way the New Testament talks about him. This is Jude 14 and 15. Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Enoch's earthly ministry before the flood was one of truth-telling and the prophesying of God's coming judgment. Enoch is also interesting as a prophet to the Gentile world before there was an Israel. Of course, both views, whether you see this as Moses and Elijah or Enoch and Elijah, both views have Elijah in common. And I think this is a good guess. Listen to Malachi 4, 5 and 6. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of Yahweh. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Probably there, so I will not come and smite the earth with a curse. A warning to the whole globe that God is about to bring judgment and Elijah will come just before the great and terrible day of the Lord to warn of coming judgment. And what will he do? He will knit the hearts of the fathers to their children and the children of their fathers, speaking of Jews. What will it be like for descendants way down the line from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 2,000 years removed from the first century or more, to have their hearts knit to the hearts of the fathers, to think like Abraham, to love Jesus because Abraham looked forward to him, to cling to the promises related to Messiah and a land the way the fathers did. What will it be like for a nation of Israelites to believe their own Bibles? That's the ministry of Elijah that is still yet future. And it is true that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but not all that was prophesied of Elijah came to pass in John the Baptist's ministry. And so just as there were two advents or two comings of Messiah, so we believe there will also be two arrivals of this preparatory prophetic ministry designed by God to prepare the world, to prepare Israel for Messiah's arrival. Two arrivals, two preparations. The second literal coming of Christ will be presaged by the second literal coming of Elijah. And it's not unreasonable to believe that the original Elijah will himself have this final witness ministry. It's actually intriguing to think about two mortals who never died to come back to the earth and die as witnesses. What we do know from this passage, from Revelation 11, is that whoever these witnesses are, they are alive in John's day. Verse 4 uses a present tense to describe them standing before the Lord. That's present tense. That was present tense 2,000 years ago. And they will be given by Jesus. That's future tense in verse 3. And they will prophesy on the earth. That's also future tense. And they will do so for 1,260 days. Let's look at their miracles. Verses 5 and 6. If anyone wishes to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And the second phrase should probably be read like this. And if anyone even might wish to harm them, they must be killed by fire out of their mouths. Two different ways these things are, are, are stated. And, and the first is, if anyone goes to harm them, they will die by fire out of their mouths. And if anyone even thinks about wanting to, they are to be killed in this way. We haven't seen anything like this. These witnesses are invincible. There will be many believers killed throughout the tribulation period, but these two cannot be killed. And like Elijah in 2 Kings 1, uh, Elijah called down fire from the sky. These ones don't call down fire from the sky, but fire just goes out from them. They don't need weapons. They don't, don't need an iron dome. They don't need any kind of defenses. But fire comes out of their mouths to destroy enemies. 
we're accustomed to thinking our battle is not against flesh and blood, but theirs will be. This is different. And this is a contrast to the church age and to being witnesses now. What are we commanded to do? Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Stephen was stoned to death praying for his enemies. Paul was singing songs in prison before he was beheaded by Nero. Peter was crucified upside down. Christians were fed to wild animals and to the fires and to the firing squads. Christians throughout the church age have been vulnerable, being delivered over daily as sheep for slaughter. In fact, the word witness is the Greek word martyr. And we think of that in terms of someone who gives up his life for a cause. That has been the church age witness, willing to suffer. If you're an enemy of the gospel, kill me and I'll pray that you are forgiven. And I hope you come to Christ. But these two witnesses have a different ministry from the Lord. Destroy your enemies. Notice that the whole world is allied against the truth. Remember how Elijah felt alone? Against the world in his day, against Ahab and Jezebel, against the false prophets of apostate Israel in his first days on the earth. And how Enoch stands out in Genesis 5, centuries before the flood, singularly as having walked with God and proclaimed his truth. And now whoever these two witnesses are in Revelation 11, they are alone against the world. Look at verse 6. They have authority to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. They also have authority over the waters to turn them to blood, to strike the earth with every plague as often as they wish. The same miracle that Elijah performed in 1 Kings, uh, three and a half years, he shut up the sky. Listen to James 5. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. He prayed again, and the sky poured rain. There is fire like Elijah in 1 Kings 17. There is water turned to blood like Moses in Exodus 7. Think about these judgments in light of all that we've seen so far of the cosmic judgments coming down from heaven in addition to the work of these two witnesses. Much of the world's water has already been turned to blood. The supply chain has been disrupted. The world food supply has been damaged. The environment is broken. You can imagine a world of people crying out for a morsel of bread and for a drink of clean water. They will do anything for these things. They will kill for these things. They will do anything but repent. Next we see in their career, their death. Look at verse 7. When the witnesses have finished their witness, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them. He will overcome them and he will kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the street. The beast who comes up out of the abyss will find out more about him. That is the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, uh, the great satanically driven imposter. And he will make war with them. We haven't seen a battle scene like this. Get all your armies together against two guys. And everybody who tries to come up against them gets destroyed by fire. And so the Antichrist makes his war against them. Listen, anyone who could silence the witnesses, who could bring an end to their pronouncements, who could stop their miracles, would be what? A hero, a savior, a a messiah, if you will, even a god. Is there someone who could be our champion and make the hard words stop Could someone put an end to the hate speech and the judgment? Is there anyone who can break through the impenetrable defenses and shut up the truth? And he does. Verse 8, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city. How does he do it? I mean, if anybody came up to them, if even anybody wanted to kill them, they had to be destroyed by fire. The answer is in verse 7. When they have finished their witness. Listen, the the witnesses were immortal until their ministry was done. And, and, And this, of course, is true for every witness of Jesus Christ. The beast could not have victory unless and until God ordained it. Remember, all of this is pre written history. Nothing is out of God's sovereign control. When man is at his worst and the world is at its darkest, God is still sovereign. 
The victory of the beast is itself a judgment from God against the world. The world will be duped. The world will reject Jesus as king and they'll take another king. It's not the first time this has happened in history where God gets rejected in all of his goodness, in all of his generosity, in all of his benevolence for sorry imposters by a world of ingrates. They don't want the Lord of the earth to be their king. And they will for a short while be given the fruit of their desires. So the Antichrist wins a temporary victory and, and their bodies lie in the street. They leave them exposed. This is spite and resentment. And notice what Jerusalem is called in verse 8. It is called the great city. There's another great city later in the book. That's Babylon. We'll get to that later. This is clearly Jerusalem. It is called spiritually other names, which is a clue to interpreting the whole book of Revelation. Take things at face value unless otherwise indicated. Here, otherwise is indicated, and it's really clear. The symbol is clear. Jerusalem is called Sodom. It's not a nice name. God describes the city of his own affections, the city of promise, with an epithet describing their immoralities. And he calls them Egypt, describing their idolatries. And it gets very clear at the end of the verse, where their Lord was crucified. It's not a pretty picture for the holy city here. Look at verse 9. Those from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations were accustomed to that set of groupings of people and and thinking in terms of God's redemption. He will save people from every tongue, tribe, nation, and people. Here, it is the world of earth dwellers from every background allied together against God and His message, and they participate here in the worldwide spectacle of gloating over the dead witnesses. They would not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. This is indignity, humiliation, It is the worldwide gloat. It's worse than dancing on their graves. It's leaving the corpses out to rot and we're all going to watch it. Look at verse 10. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. King James says they will rejoice and make merry over it. It's a three and a half day party. They exchange gifts. This is a, a worldwide holiday. What are the earth dwellers celebrating? Well, look, we, we have nothing to fear now. Well, we heard that truth speech and we beat it. We have a champion stronger than those invincible prophets. The truth of the Bible has been silenced. The God of the Bible is beatable. Let's stay at it. They got the alarm clock of truth to stop sounding. What does that let them do? Live any way they want without consequences. In fact, the world will be willing to accept a lie if it lets me do me. Why are they celebrating? The end of verse 10. Because the two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Listen, is it really a torment to be told you have a fatal disease and you need the cure? And here's the cure. Is it really torment to be told you have the problem that you actually have? Friends, speaking the truth of God's grace in the gospel and coming judgment from the Lord is not truly torment. But it feels such for those who do not want grace. We find fifthly their resurrection down in verse 11. After three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. The party's over. Time to be very afraid. Verse 12, they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And those witnesses went up into heaven in the cloud and their enemies watched them. This was an ascension after a very undeniable death and a very undeniable resurrection for the world to see. That leads to the last phase of their career. It is their vindication Last two verses of chapter 11. In that hour was a great earthquake. A tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The rest were terrified and they gave glory to the God of heaven. 
This is one of five specific earthquakes detailed in Revelation. This one is not the worst one, but it's really bad. And it produces terror and glory. It does not produce repentance and faith. This is doxology under compulsion. What does this mean that they gave glory to God? I think this is in the line of Philippians 3.21, that Jesus has the power to subject all things to himself. It's the same that we see in Philippians 2. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. There will be compulsory doxology. People will have to say, okay, you're God. Doesn't mean they repent. The demons acknowledge who he is and they tremble. That's the kind of fear and doxology here. Interestingly, this same word for glory is used in Luke 4.15. Jesus healed people, and the text tells us he was glorified by all. The very next verse, they try to take him to the precipice of a cliff in his hometown to throw him off and kill him. I don't believe this is repentance. And then verse 14 gives us the conclusion of their ministry. The second woe is past. The third woe comes quickly. The completion of the ministry of these two witnesses coincides with the end of the sixth trumpet judgment, a.k.a. the second woe. One more woe to come, one more trumpet, and that trumpet unfolds seven more judgments called bowl judgments, and they unfold in rapid succession in the closing days of the Great Tribulation. All of that culminates in the Battle of Armageddon and the return of the King. What do we learn from these two witnesses? I don't expect any of you to have supernatural power to breathe fire against your enemies. But you might feel alone. You might feel a hostile world complaining about the truth, no matter how graciously it's delivered. I want you to think about your own heart for a moment. It is self-destructive to mute the truth. Suicidal to silence the truth. The Word of God speaks, your ears may tingle, your conscience may burn, and you can hit the snooze button. My friend, don't do that. That alarm is designed to wake you out of spiritual stupor so that you don't go down the path of destruction you're on. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, the alarm is sounding, the truth is speaking Don't take the alarm clock out and have it shot to pieces. Listen. You cannot change history. It is going where God ordains. What you can do is yield. Repent. Find life in Christ in exchange for all the emptiness of the other things you've been trying to pursue. The Lord of glory is the Lord of grace and he offers you this day salvation if you will but turn. You will not always have that chance. And in this narrative, whose side are you on? Are you on the side of the world? Celebrate when truth speech goes silent. Trade gifts with your buddies when gospelizers are put in jail or killed? Or are you on the side of God's witnesses? Christian, as a witness to Jesus Christ, here's a parallel to these two. You are immortal until the Lord says, come up here. (laughs) Nothing can harm you Except the Lord ordains. And so be bold with grace. Let's pray. O Lord Jesus, this earth is yours and it is filled with usurpers and rebels who are on the wrong team. And Lord, we were on the wrong team. Born on it. Reveling in it wandering around in darkness and slavery and blindness and emptiness. And you and your love saved the likes of us. We pray that we would not forget why we're here. 
We pray that we would not forget in these easy times that we are to be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. And we pray even now as we sing, as we revel in the reality that you are king and you will reign forever, it is our ambition to herald that return and to be faithful as your ambassadors. Help us to this. In Jesus' name, amen.